broadcasting live from Child V's Theron. They can't all be winners. This is Pop Culture Reference, your one-stop reference for all things pop culture. I'm one of your hosts, Seamus Connolly. And I'm Garrett Strother. And that was the easiest to understand intro we've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I think so. No questions. I think we can Moving wrap on. up the show. I think you yeah. can do plug, does, you know, plug social media. Uh, if you yeah. want to reach the show, you can uh, find uh, us on social media. Uh, uh, me- uh, no, I can't say the whole, my whole outro or else we actually legally have to start playing the outro <laughs> that's, music. I have that's to true. Hold it's like tongue. catching the golden snitch. It's yeah, exactly. over. The game's over. Yeah, no matter what. Yeah, you get it. We we understand how our own podcast works. Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> uh, today we will be riding into Valhalla, shiny and chrome, on the tales of George Miller's new masterpiece, Furiosa. I don't think it's spoiling too much to say that we are both fans, but we will oh, we yeah. will have some things to say. Believe I, me, I cannot wait. There's so much. There's so much as as any Mad Max saga film has. There's so much to talk about. I I can't wait to get into the bizarre guzzling of it all. But first, we do have a few pieces of news to talk about. First up is the passing of prolific character actor Dabney Coleman, most known probably for his roles in 80s classics 9 to 5, War Games and Tootsie beloved by children everywhere as Principal Prickly on Mm, the show Recess. Recess. Of course. And I want to give special shout out to him in My Date with the President's Daughter (laughs) as the president. And the Tom Hanks comedy, The Man with One Red Shoe, which is certainly not the first time I had ever seen him. I definitely had seen Stuart Little and Inspector Gadget by that point. Oh, sure. Not to mention the series and subsequent films of the Recess franchise. And I personally, I I have a vivid memory of me and my older brother both getting DVDs from our aunt for Christmas. And my older brother got Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith, hot off the presses. And I got Cloak and Dagger, a movie I had never even heard of. (laughs) And my disappointment was just like, I don't, okay, this is just a movie I'll never watch. And I ended up watching Cloak and Dagger a hundred thousand times with Dabney Coleman as Jack Flack, the imaginary best friend. I, I to this is day, that I the, love. Is that the kid in ET with the kid from ET is in the video game? Is that what that is? Well, no, it's, it's he he gets a video game cartridge with secret government plans for like a like a high altitude strike plane and he has this video game cartridge and bad guys are chasing him and he's using his imaginary best friend action hero Dabney Coleman to get out of trouble it's incredible and so much darker than uh, I understood as a kid but man is it good Dabney Coleman's sweet spot was what if it was a movie where I uh, an unassuming young guy finds government secrets on his computer device that he uses to play games yeah you know i never really uh definitely as as a kid growing up as a fan of both war games and cloak and deck i was just like wow these these two movies are great for some reason never put them together also always good just to shout out that i feel like he was stuck in a lot of thankless roles playing you know dis disreputable or or bad guys and i always liked it when he would show up in something where he wasn't that and it sounds like that is one of those i also think that he gives a very interesting nuanced performance in on golden pond which really easily could have been a i'm just you know this guy who's dating your daughter and i'm a jerk role Mm. but he elevates it i think and I, I he was good in everything he was ever in. I've never seen a bad Dabney Coleman performance. Yeah, as far I mean, I definitely haven't seen as much as I probably should, or maybe I have and I just didn't realize. But honestly, same here. I can't think of a, a role that I've seen him in that I didn't think he was knocking it out of the park in. So you know, my date with the president's daughter is what you're saying mostly. That you know, a movie I should see sometime. Is that true? Have you not seen that? I mean, pretty don't much, pretty much every don't bother. Oh no. Oh well. I mean, it's not, I don't remember it being (laughs) horrible, but I mean... Yeah, Dabney Coleman's in it, how bad can it be? It's probably, I think that's a DCOM, it's probably on Disney Plus. 
well, I'll run into it eventually. That's a vault deep dive that will be like, hey, why do we do this for the show? That might be fun. I also, he was in a Muppets, maybe? Was he in Caper? Was he? I've was never he? seen Caper. I'm looking it up I, I, right that's now. That's another big blind spot on my pop culture checklist. He was in Muppets Take Manhattan, which is why I was not certain off the bat if he oh. was in it, because I've not seen that one since I was a kid. Is is he, he's probably like the guy that's like, I'll give you all the money in the world, I'm not a scam artist, or whatever. For once, Seamus, the, the, the tables have turned and you are talking about Muppets things that I don't know what you're saying. Wow, so. that has literally never happened before in all of the years <laughs> that we've known each other. That's wild. Good lord. Well, there you go. Dabney Coleman, Muppets Take Manhattan, you know more than I do. <laughs> Roll credits. <laughs> Audio, no. <laughs> no, no, can't, no. I don't even know if it'll work if you say it anyway, so I'm, I'm not I've sure. never tried, and I never will. Uh, the wand chooses the wizard that's my (laughs) second harry potter reference in news i don't know what's going on with that well moving on to our next bit of news here another very notable passing of richard sherman prolific composer of of many famous classics uh there's like literally more than i thought that i could list all at once Big ones like the jungle book aristocrats winnie the pooh i mean mary poppins come on that's Probably some of the best music ever produced by the Walt Disney Company. Right up there, a childhood favorite of mine, again, going back, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Absolute Chitty Chitty Bangers on that soundtrack, if I may. Truly, truly great stuff. Dude, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, drop me out of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang as we're flying over the English Channel, please. That is... <laughs> That's the dream. In, in a weird one-piece striped male bathing suit, you know, with a bald oh, cap and all. That's not that's not the Sherman Brothers' fault, because he, of course, was a singer, uh, a songwriting duo with his brother Robert Sherman, who died uh, many years ago. Uh, I also feel like we have to mention their monumental contributions to the Walt Disney theme parks, including everyone's favorite song, It's a Small, it's a small world, world After oh All. Oh my god, I that's phenomenal. That's... One of the literally one of the most famous things about Disney parks. That's that's incredible. And they wrote it. This is a fun fact to be a ballad. They wrote it to be slow and and kind of contemplative. <laughs> and they the Walt Disney Company was like, hey, maybe pick it up a little bit, guys. Hey, you we're know. not trying to put him to sleep in there, Sherman. Let's go. And I think uh, my my favorite of maybe all of their songs is. The tiki 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 tiki. Room. Oh wow! No way. That's a that's another great one. It is. I I mean that is that's another certified banger. You're talking about chitty chitty bangers, but that's a that's one. Too. That is truly truly up there. Yeah, monumental work that will that that this body of work will be here when we are gone. Even I feel like it's just it's timeless. And very nice that both of the fellas we are memorializing today in their 90s when they passed, leaving behind yes. a large body of work, which very, very much so. always takes some of the sting out of being able to celebrate that kind of that kind of prolific career. But we are not done with this kind of stuff yet because we have a Disney danger. <laughs> oh no! That's oh, not yeah. what it sounds like. No, it's I know. Close. I, I, we never line it up right. We never do, but I always try. I did. You you know, it's like trying to hit a moving target while blindfolded. Is ba- is as hard as it is to match the timing of a sound effect that you yourself are putting in later. Oh gosh, you know, I'm an editing whiz, and even in my genius skill, sometimes I I can't. I can't wrangle us two on the mic here. That's just, it's beyond my power. Uh, this is, what an irreverent way to segue into the fact that Pixar has laid off 175 staffers. Now, we've technically already covered this news earlier in the year when Pixar announced massive layoffs. And this is actually, I mean, this, I'm not giving the company any credit for this. This is actually 25 fewer staffers than they said they were going to lay off. But I guess, you know, the year's not out yet. Oh, no, they, not even close. In press, have been blaming their recent string of failures on the straight-to-streaming market and that they have trained audiences to expect 
Pixar films to show up on Disney Plus, if not day and date, at least a couple weeks mm-hmm. after they show up in theaters. And, you know, I do think that is part of it for sure, but I think the dilution of the Pixar brand started a long time ago, and that it's going to be really difficult for them to win back their reputation, if it's possible at all, especially as Disney continues to cut out a lot of the company, people that have been with Pixar Studios for years. Yeah, it's it's not looking great. We're, we're two weeks, is it, out from Inside Out 2 coming Dude, out as well? I about that. That's uh, real. Yeah. yeah, and so inevitably when Inside Out 2 is probably not going to do great. I don't know. I Personally, I don't know if anybody's excited for Inside Out 2. I, I mean, Inside Out, the last great Pixar movie. Pro- nope, that's not true. Coco and Soul both came out after Inside Out. But uh, Yes, exactly. One of the last great Pixar movies. And yeah, it's, I, it's a very interesting strategy that they're relying on here. I think also, I, don't, I will be very curious to see uh, Pixar sequels are very up in the air. I think generally you have no idea what kind of quality you're going to be getting. You could mm-hmm. be getting a Toy Story sequel, or you could be getting Toy Story 4. And <laughs> there's really no way of knowing uh, until you're sitting in the theater, because even something as abysmal as Cars 2 being, can be caught, followed up by Cars 3, which is actually, I think, a pretty decent movie. And... I'm very curious, is Inside Out 2, is it a cash grab? Is it something that they have really put a lot of thought and and heart into? And it will remain to be seen, I suppose. Yeah, I, you know, I still defend Inside Out 1 as well. There's still been some pretty yeah, good, good ones in the modern Pixar era. But, but man, like you say, if they strike gold, like Stinky Pete, the prospector himself, Toy Story 2 style, then I will eat my words. But I just don't think with as abstract of a yeah toy story is about living toys no never mind we'll see when it comes out i don't know i don't know i don't know what i'm talking about i feel <laughs> unsure i feel less confident about inside out 2 than most other things that have come out in the last couple of years but i i don't I, know i feel more confident about it than lightyear oh dude well i straight up forgot lightyear existed so i wasn't uh that wasn't included <laughs> in what i just said except for that one and probably the other three that i don't remember uh, or didn't see this this is the problem is that they have turned pixar films into true non-events like they, yeah, they're not even something yeah. you think about anymore and it used to be a brand that was so strong that you couldn't miss one i remember up came out in the summer of 2009 and everywhere you would go people would be like have you seen up yet you haven't seen up yet you need to go see up right now and there's just not that kind of urgency with watching a pixar movie anymore even if you can literally watch it on your home television literally instantly with no problems at all i i mean like toy story 3 maybe was the last time it really felt like something and then i mean incredibles 2 and and uh incredibles 2 was at least a cultural moment yeah, even that, if it wasn't very good exactly it was still like way more people were running to see they were like oh man you know the nostal- the nostalgia of it all the you know they technically left the first one on a cliffhanger you which know. was also their last hit uh, so it's maybe very yeah. intentional that inside out 2 is supposed to be this like return to form for pixar and again it it feels a little underhanded for us to discuss the corporate studio strategy behind certain releases while against the backdrop of these massive layoffs that are cutting the talent out of the company that we are hoping will, Mm. you know, feed back into quality storytelling. So even if Inside Out 2 is great, it's not like they didn't just lay off 175 people. Exactly. There's, and as you mentioned, there's still much more time this year for more of that to happen. I feel like if theatrical does well, then they'll blame it on streaming. If streaming does well, they'll blame it on theatrical and cut corners where it's going to be profitable for them regardless. It's just, it's just not looking good no matter what, I feel like. I just watched that four hour uh, Galactic Star Cruiser video essay where the last hour is her talking about how (laughs) this is indicative of a larger problem where Disney will do literally anything to save as much money as possible. Well, at least at least more than just me and you are talking about it. That's good. 
And in our last bit of news, which I'm sure we will spend a very brief amount of time discussing, Seamus, the third Knives Out film, the third Benoit Blanc mystery, officially has a title, Wake Up Dead Man, following in tradition of a Radiohead song, then a Beatles song, it is now a U2 song that has become the focal point for Benoit Blanc's next case. And between the time that the title was announced and recording of this show, three cast members have also been announced. Josh O'Connor, who is very hot right now for his recent role in Challengers. Kaylee Spaney, who people will know from Priscilla and Civil War. And Seamus and I just watched in Bad Times at the El Royale. And Andrew Scott uh, from Fleabag and Moriarty from Sherlock, of course. Yeah, that was that. That's the newest one there. That Andrew Scott news drop. I'm very excited for him to be involved. I think he's a phenomenal actor. Very pale, very British. You know what else? Can you ask we for? Got a, very. It's, I'm sensing a theme going on here. <laughs> yeah, do you? Soft talking pale Brits. So do you have a lot of that, those on your casting? Your your well, your fan casting. It is our podcasting call. We haven't had one of these oh, in a while. Yes. It's been a while. It's and like, so long I didn't even remember the name of the segment. Wow, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Seamus, I think you and I ran into the same problem, which is there are way too many people that we want to see in a Benoit Blanc mystery. Uh, we told each other that we would pick four. I suspect that we will end up picking more than four or at least shouting them out on air but since you asked me first i will give you i will give you <laughs> one i how about we go back and forth until one of us runs out i i i'm down all right with maybe maybe some deeper discussion about our initial eight here so that we could actually stratify in some way our conversation so it's not just us listing actors I uh, fair enough, fair enough. I'll give it, I'll give it to you. I'm I'm so curious. I'm I'm hoping that we have a good few in common because uh, I I then again I get so many people that I would love to see. So this. many people. My first guy up here, Kyle Chandler, because I need you to go into your mind palace, Sherlock style, and picture Kyle Chandler saying. Benoit, buddy, you gotta talk to me. What's going on here? Damn, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I do like Kyle Chandler. He he could be he could be up there. I think I I like him. He's very talented. He can do funny. He can do serious. I like it. I think so too. So I'm I'm glad that you agree, Seamus. But who do you have up first? John Ham, and maybe I'm a little Ooh. maybe I'm a little biased because of our Afro uh, aforementioned. Bad times at the El Royale viewing, but he, he's he got it all, you know? He could be the bad guy. He could be the dead body, you know? He could he could, he could run in, be a, be a police lieutenant or a grifter. I think he's really got a lot of range to be in a, in a fun idea like this. Yeah, I, I've always wanted him to play, and this is kind of, this is going somewhere. It's not just an aside about John <laughs> Hamm. I've always wanted him to play... Dogberry in Much Do About Nothing. I think he would be really good at that bumbling but hyper confident oh, yeah. police role. And I think that he could bring that energy to Knives Out really well. If he had almost like Noah Segan, who's in Ryan Johnson's all of Ryan Johnson's movies, mm. but in the first Knives Out, he's that overzealous uh trooper. And I think that John Hamm could do a kind of similar role to that really well against oh, yeah. Daniel Craig. Who's next? Who's next on your top? Linda Cardellini. That's a good one. I do love Linda Cardell. I love seeing her in stuff that's not Scooby Doo, which is what I knew her from <laughs> for twenty years almost, uh, probably. If you, if you want to watch a pop culture reference TikTok about that, it's up on our TikTok <laughs> feed about how Seamus, I do not think knew Linda Cardellini's name until after we started the show. For sure. That is not even like maybe. That's definitely. Like I was just I had no idea. So I just think that she fits the vibe really well of these films. I I don't have very many British people in my lineup here, so I don't know if that's gonna that's going to change anything or not. Actually, I don't think I have any British people in my lineup here. Wait, but why? does it have to be British? Is this I'm, British just, I'm just trying to, you know, we're trying to find the edges of maybe how casting is working and what the tone is for this new sure. one. But anyway, Linda Cardellini, I think she'd be a great fit. 
Yeah, definitely agree. Another great fit. I, I have such a... I'm like casting roles that don't exist in this movie, but I would love to see Mads Mikkelsen as some kind of rival detective to a Benoit Blanc, maybe caught up in the same mystery, a, a Belloc to his Indiana Jones, perhaps. Uh, because historically, Mads Mikkelsen and Indiana Jones go together like a peanut butter and <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> this is his redemption. He's in a <laughs> lot of weird stuff now, and he would definitely be the weird, like the hyper-serious European detective and then Benoit Blanc is gonna be doing his his you know Cajun thing oh no this the second you said it I saw it, it yeah, right. you, you're totally <laughs> right has he been Moriarty before I feel like he's been Moriarty before but I can't oh. picture him in because he's not on Sherlock he's not in that RDJ once right, anyway right. I just well, it he feels was... I was like we have another Moriarty, but I don't think we do. His his uh, uh, Hannibal Lecter show, I feel like, has an energy yeah. about it that's very, like, super villain, high-class super villainy. So that's probably what's painting that for you. For sure. For sure. No, that's a good, that's a good pull. I like that a lot. <laughs> Thank you. What, what, what else do you got? Jeffrey Wright? Bingo! There's our match, baby! Oh, <laughs> I have it as Mads Mikkelsen and or Jeffrey Wright on the same line. <laughs> if I, that is beautiful. I probably could have called this one if I'm being honest. <laughs> um, it, oh, it's so it's right there. He's he's ha we're having a Jeffrey Wright assance at the moment. He's in more stuff than certainly. ever. I think I and think he could do it. He's funny. He's he's honestly he's bringing a lot of the same things to the table as John Hamm. He can be funny yeah. when he needs to be. He can be intellectual. Um, he could be serious. He could be a little scary. Uh, both super he, handsome, kind of a little bit older dudes. Yeah, salt. That they have both have a salt and pepper thing yes. going on. Yeah, yeah. So that's cute. I that is not surprising that that was our <laughs> that was our intersection here. I'll be curious to see if we have any more. Uh, well, I think this is four for me. Is it uh, whatever? That this is your fourth. Yes, it is. I'm talking. Give me a Brian Cranston. Get him Ooh. in the room. Do his super deep voice thing that he's been doing in things like uh, like Argyle and. I had another example. Oh, uh, <laughs> Argyle Redemption Asteroid. Tour is what you're saying, I think. Just the oh, entire yeah, hold cast. On. Hold on, you're right, maybe. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, like I saw Asteroid City not that long ago, and he's got this this narrator thing going on through yeah. that as well. I think he can. I think he can slip in again. Comedy and drama married in a really interesting way that that they they could slip in. I think he should be doing Uncle Ron for the first half of the movie, and then once you find out that he's the killer, he becomes <laughs> like White. a Heisenberg. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 very good. I like that. Well, my last one up here is Ariana DeBose, another Argyle alum who has not gotten as many quality roles as she should have after her Oscar winning performance as Anita in Steven Spielberg's West Side mm. Story but I think that she would bring a very interesting youthful energy to a movie like this although we do have more young people in the cast announced thus far than normal in a Benoit Blanc film yeah that is interesting now that I'm uh, uh realizing it just as you said it just now because I feel like I picked much more old people more like the first Knives Out mystery but I feel like we've been trending younger as we as we're going here so I guess that makes sense yeah for sure so I th I mean we've got that's a pretty solid lineup of of Eight mostly A-list talent that we just mm -hmm. uh, laid out here. So I would, however, like to continue to go down the rabbit hole that we have both uh, <laughs> dug for ourselves. Oh yes, absolutely. I think I think off mic we make a uh, uh, a casting. It's like a Deadpool, but it's a casting pool, and we pick our top oh, three. That would be good, and we keep money on it until it comes out. Because I think you know, with the whole like Ethan Hawke thing and Glass Onion, literally anything is possible. You know, for sure. Yeah, that's a good point. Are there any other than your main top four here that you want to shout out on air? Uh, I, well, actually, I said Brian Cranston, but what I actually wrote was Brian Cranston or Aaron Paul, but not both. But if we're trending younger. <laughs> I think Aaron younger. Paul. I think Aaron Paul could get in there. I think he hasn't quite gotten out of the shadow of his own work yet, and I think this yeah. would be an interesting way for him to to do that. May I? May I re reply with a <laughs> with a Jesse Plemons? Can a man oh, get a Jesse Plemons? God, 
dude i yeah please and thank you if if you may <laughs> i i would i would love that more than anything maybe and i'm a little disappointed that i didn't think of it the first time around interesting if i were to have guessed the two people that we would have overlap it would have been jeffrey wright and jesse Plemons. i because i threw christopher lloyd into my lists because he's still waddling out and doing Ooh. interesting stuff and that would be the ultimate I, homage you know yeah well i i was thinking that this is kind of a this isn't really one of my casting things, but I didn't even have it mm. in my list here. I would love a, you know, you have like one scene roles like M. Emmett Walsh in the first Knives Out, and you just mentioned Ethan Hawke in Glass Onion. Mm-hmm. I would love to see Gene Hackman do a one scene oh, role. Whoa. Damn. God. That would be so much fun. I had so I have so much fun with these movies. I am this isn't another Netflix deal, is it? Is this going to theaters? Oh of course it is. Okay, no, no theaters. I, no theaters for us. That is well I still had a lot of fun at Glass Sunday regardless, <laughs> I suppose. But I, I am I am I think that even maybe makes it more open to like anybody could truly be in here. I we The we Rock have... is <laughs> oh, in no. Knives Out Three. Oh, uh, Ryan Reynolds is Kevin Hart in oh. Knives Out Three. <laughs> no. Wait a minute, hold on, hold, <laughs> hold on, back to uh, that. reverse it. I would actually the first Kevin Hart The Rock movie, other than Hobson Shaw, that they would get me to see would be a movie where. They swapped bodies, but I guess that's kind of just Jumanji, which I've also seen and didn't count just now. <laughs> do they switch bodies with each other? I don't. Re- I don't think they do, but they might in the second one. But that's it's a compl. Well, the third one technically, because there's the oh, because the first boy. Rock and Kevin Hart one is technically the second one. We have somehow gotten really off of Knives Out. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say we were wrapping this part up too, and then we were we went back. I don't know. Uh, at the end of the day, all I can say is. Kyle Chandler saying Benoit Blanc. And I'm there for it. But Seamus, why don't we go ahead and hit that guzzling tank straight into our main segment, Furiosa. Ooh, witness me. For today's main segment, we're going to be talking about the new addition to the Mad Max anthology, Furiosa. This, we've been waiting for this for a decade, pretty much. The follow-up to Fury Road, one of the most acclaimed action films of all time, certainly in the conversation for one of the best action films of all time. Oh, yes. And Furiosa, while I do not think it's as good as Fury Road, and I know there are some out there that do, I think is a worthy successor uh, and, and fit to wear the title of Fury Road. Proud, like proudly, it's a great B-side duology to that film. I think, Seamus, where did you fall? No, yeah, I, I absolutely loved it. I thought it was entirely satisfying for the you know nine and a half year wait between these two. I had like as somebody who was obsessed with the old Mad Max movies in high school. I I think I could just watch a million of these new ones and Furiosa. While I was a little bit scared, it wasn't gonna be quite as insane as Fury Road. It absolutely gets there and then some. And I want to go back. You've already seen it twice, and I'm actually jealous. I would love to go back and watch it again. I want to do a double feature with Fury Road. Honestly, you could do it in either order too. I feel like they would be really satisfying in either order. I I do think yeah, I yeah I agree and I can't understand why there are not double features being booked at every oh, man. multiplex. Yeah, you think with the amount of re-releases that are going down, that would have been a no-brainer. Maybe I don't know. Maybe they were unsure about how much it was actually going to be like a direct prequel. I actually I thought there was going to be a lot more space in terms of proximity to Fury Road and all the adventures of that, I thought there was going to be a lot more space between the movies, but it feels like a lot more room for Furiosa 2, uh, Mad Max, I, uh, and I know there's uh, George Miller is an insane person and he already has like a hundred more Mad Max saga (laughs) movies planned, but I, um, it just felt like such a clean coupling with, with Fury Road. I, I can't blame it at all. I think that what it, Lax in Fury Road's unrelenting pace and adrenaline-spiking action. Not that there isn't plenty of great action in this film. It makes up for in 
It's massive scale, and frankly, somehow it is the darkest Mad Max movie. Interesting. You know? I don't you know. know maybe you know, not one. Honestly, I don't know. One's pretty rough. One's, I do. One's I, brutal. Thinking about thinking about about um. Oh, what's his friend's stupid name in one? His best friend, his partner's stupid name. Oh, um, <laughs> damn it. The I'm... buff buff guy? Like buff bald chief? Goose, like of course. Oh, Goose, yeah, Goose. sure. I, because how can I not remember that his best friend's name, who may or may not meet some kind of unfortunate fate, well. would be named Goose um in a the movie like that and also other <laughs> things that happen later in that movie uh that are also pretty dark. Oh man, you know, maybe especially for Goose. You should you should watch Mad Max. <laughs> I've seen Mad Max. Yeah, you should rewatch it. I've seen Mad Max. Yeah. Rewatch it. Cuz I know I, 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 I know I remember I remember I remember I remember I remember. <laughs> are you <laughs> sure you should let me know about it if you remember? All of our back and forth aside, I guess I should say I was surprised at how dark this got when I was fully expecting it to be unsettling, similar to the way that Fury Road is in some moments. Um, because if you were unsettled by some of the imagery in Fury Road, which you rightfully should be, um, <laughs> oh my God, you, will, yeah. you will likewise and probably more extremely be unsettled by some of the imagery in Furiosa. But the idea of taking the style of action that only Fury Road really has, the Road Warrior gets close, but it doesn't quite meet that threshold that these two do, I think. And taking that style of action and putting it on this mythic, folkloric, almost fantasy scale is a really interesting idea, and I want to know why. Maybe, is it because of scale? Is it because of the idea of moving away from Max too quickly would have been a problem. Why Miller chose to do... I mean, I know that there's a very complicated production history, which we'll actually get into our in our main segment, but, like, it almost seems like this is the story he's been waiting to make. Very literally, he has, you know? Like, you mentioned we are going to get into how long that took and all the different avenues that were taken, but it's it's like he was ready to pop off at any second. He finally got the chance to expand a universe with a canon that is so weird and retold and repurposed. It is that fantasy, the fairy tale of this disturbing, surreal wasteland of people. I think it's I think it's woven together beautifully. I think it's it really hammers home that if you really care more about the you know, the connecting pieces fitting together so, so perfectly, it's not really going to match up for you. But if you're just like, you're there for the journey, the the wide wasteland of strange events that are all kind of in mm-hmm. proximity, I think it's incredible. I want more of that. It, it It's the same feeling that I got when I was playing the Mad Max game, which I know you've been dabbling in lately, where I have. you don't need it to be Mel Gibson. You don't Hell, you don't even really need it to be anyone else from the movies proper if it's just in the the time and space in this grand... Like, it seems like the biggest world, even though it is confined solely to the continent of Australia, but it feels so massive and thought out, and, like, Miller could do a million dragged-on shows worth of, of content, but he's... He's really narrowing down how to successfully expand his universe without making it Star Wars or Game of Thrones. Yeah. Oh, or... that would be insufferable. I, yeah. uh, I've been I've been thinking about how grateful I am that he somehow has not succumbed to making Mad Max way more whatever you want to call that, way more bubblegummy for the regular audience, but still being the most badass movies I've ever you know, in the last nine years. I've been waiting for it, and and nothing else has really scratched that same kind of itch. It's incredible. Well, he refuses to bow to commercialism, and that is evident, like, very thoroughly through his work. And, I mean, frankly, I am... You know how annoyed I get with discussing box office to any extent. Oh, sure, sure. But, like, box office reflects that. Fury Road was not a particularly financially successful film. This is not shaping up to be one either, And it's because they're so of themselves, they're so mean, they don't bow down to the franchise machine. Like you talked about, 
consciously avoiding active connective tissue, active callbacks between films in a way that a lot of franchises today rely on, that he makes text in Furiosa in a way we will get into in spoilers, the concept that has been evident since Road Warrior, which is this is a mythos. This is not meant to be taken literally. It's not meant to be broken down and re-pieced together to figure out how it all works as one kind of overarching story. It's it's stories of ronins and mm. cowboys, men with no name, women with no name in this film, who are wandering through the wasteland. And I totally agree with you. I'd watch a million more of them, but I'm glad that he is saving up so that Mad Max and, and the saga that he is surrounded by is carefully in his protective hands. It's almost like if, if Fury Road and, and Furiosa had done commercially better at the box office, we would already be staring down the barrel of two limited series and uh you know another a, a spin-off franchise about the young people eater or whatever you know like they're <sighs> yeah it's a sweet spot it's just as good as it needs to be to actually blow our minds in the theater and it's not being like snatched up by the by the extra greedy people that tried to already kind of stiff George Miller the first time around when he did Fury Road Cough, cough, the Bene Gesserit prequel series on <laughs> oh, HBO no. Max. Cough, cough. Oh, never heard of it. Lisan al Gaib. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that show will be good. <laughs> I haven't watched any of the trailers or anything, but it just seems like that exact kind of franchise think that exactly. dilutes really strong theatrical brands. Or also something like Mad Max that doesn't make very much money, but people like a lot because it's really good. Um, Anya Taylor Joy is somebody that we should talk about because she does a unnervingly good job in this movie that she is able to channel the essence of Charlie Theron's Furiosa without it feeling like a cheap imitation. This was probably my biggest concern going into Furiosa is that I did not really feel confident that anyone, let alone Audie Taylor-Joy, could step into Charlie Theron's shoes. That's such an iconic role that's so well-defined with so little dialogue. And she has such unique mannerisms that you can tell every thought that's put into them. Audie Taylor-Joy, not to say I had any concept of her as a bad actor going to this, I think she's quite talented, but... She really stepped up her game for this, I think, and I'm shocked at how well she did. I Ooh. feel like, uh, well, no, well, well, hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm telling myself a little bit here. I don't have, I don't think, I'm trying to think harder, a huge history with Anya Taylor Joy's work. I'm trying to think, The Witch. You, uh, I mean, she's good in The Witch. The Northman, another Eggers. The Nor yes, um, of course. I'm trying to think of things I know you've seen. You oh last did night we do last night Soho, Soho for the we, show did we, we did do that for the and show? I I think that was like the last big thing that I was disappointed in that she yeah. was like the big the big star for and maybe that was kind of coloring my attitude going in but I agree she did incredibly well like like you said almost uncomfortably well I I know that this role in this script has been tooled and retooled and reworked with like. Charlize Theron in mind specifically for however mm -hmm. long of a time when that was still on the table. So to see Anya Taylor Joy step into that with seemingly without missing a beat at all, I I thought it was some of the most talented acting I've seen in a while. And I also want to turn that right on over to Mr. Christopher Hemsworth as well, somebody that I Chris, my friend, welcome welcome to the to, to the what, big boy leagues. The, I, like, I swear oh. to God, dude, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. I mean, uh, so much Thor, so much Thor <laughs> that it's just but like bled into my brain that if, that is if just God Thor. of War Thor were on screen instead of Marvel Thor. Yo, that's honestly a great way to think of it. Just like angry, bitter, 
crazy as hell. I thought it was. I thought he was incredible. His his whole attitude. It was giving me a little bit of like ah, another stupid thing. I'm gonna say a little Dante from Fast X. Just like whimsical enough to not like fully hate, but also doing the most disgusting, violent, horrific things I've ever seen anybody do to another character. Hey, I'll I'll bring up in it. I I will not let you suffer alone. I will bring up an insufferable performance. <laughs> um, if this is not. I don't really think it's insufferable, but uh, I do think it's insufferable when people talk about it. But I do think the common ancestor of Dante in Fast X and Dementis in this film is the Heath Ledger Joker. Uh, there is oh, a definitive yeah. element of the kind of sarcastic, sardonic reveling in chaos that both of these characters, I think, emulate from, from the Ledger. There are even a few moments in this movie specifically that I think are om- like almost straight out of The Dark Knight. Yeah, I think there's there's something there for sure. I, I've got... I've got some quotes uh, that I've been that have been rolling around my head for the last few days that I think would work very well in this example. Quotes that I can't quite get into now, but you probably have a similar, okay. yeah, a yeah. similar, yeah. Which is also very interesting because I have been reading Blood, Sweat, and Chrome, which is the production of Mad Max Fury Road, and something that I've already shared with you, but I think is an interesting kind of lens into maybe Miller's thought process is that he really wanted Heath Ledger for Max in Fury Road and then Heath Ledger un- unfortunately passed away before he was able to begin production on Fury Road well I mean like several years before right, Fury yes. Road started shooting but as far as I know Miller carried that desire for it to be Ledger all the way to when they started shooting Fury Road like he was on set with Tom Hardy being like I don't know I just really wish it were Heath man oh, um, god that's gotta be a tough working acting environment if we're being honest you know (laughs) yeah well i don't think he said that too i don't think he said that i'm sure i'm sure but he could probably feel it a little bit he could probably feel it and i i think that by the it sounds like by the end of of the production he was obviously happy with hardy's casting who is very good in that movie but this is not a podcast about mad max fury road except it kind of is only a little bit only for a couple moments here and there perhaps well i think when we get the spoilers maybe more than a couple yeah, for, moments yeah. i do want to bring up another miller film 3000 years of longing which i i think i'm the only person who saw actually if you if you want to check the box <laughs> office numbers on that a lot of that movie in this uh, again the the increased sense of scale the uh chaptered story structure and also the more mythological fantastical elements i mean it really treats these characters more like they're in greek mythology than they are in you know a cowboy movie which is kind of what the other mad max movies function as more than anything else yeah i mean it's i as i look at them it's it's like a you know the disillusion of a reality that is slipping away from a destroyed humanity you get mad max is normal uh, road war your Thunderdome kind of weird and then we get to just like Thunderdome kind of bi- weird well you know what I mean it's no it's no Fury Road Fury Road is no. biblical it's like yeah it's, that's a good way to put it actually I actually yeah that, that's kind of where I was going I guess I accidentally walked backwards into it but it is it feels like it it is legends myths biblical verses of the mysterious stranger the the heroine who survived who rose from the dead however metaphorically and whatever but but I, um, there's only so many characters I can expect to see something like this for, like a standalone that'll mean this much, that'll that'll feel like this. But even if we never got another piece of Mad Max content again, I feel like I would be, I mean, we'd kind of be living the dream no matter what. I have, I have two things uh, to, to spin off of that thought. One, I do think now that you say it, this is the first movie spinoff of a new character introduced in a previous installment of a franchise that has actually worked for me fully. And I do think that that is probably because Furiosa is for all intents and purposes, the, the lead of Fury Road. So it functions as better as a prequel mm-hmm. because how would Han Solo get his gun? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. On top of that, I have been thinking, and it's very, it's kind of kismet that these things are in the zeitgeist with each other. In revisiting the 
old Mad Max films, been thinking a lot about the circus trilogy of apes movies and how the first one is how did we how how did the apocalypse start you know roving wasteland gangs picking off mm. innocent people who are just trying to live their day to days and then you know road warrior kind of like war we see the vestiges of society as it crumbles around the people who are just trying to keep their lives together keep their communities together their families mm. safe in the new world that they've been forced to live in and by the time you get to the third installment in each, in each of them the world has devolved into uh, a fully new apocalyptic reality and then you look at the, the we look at the the fourth chapter apes uh is kingdom and fury road is fury road where it's because it's blossomed into something entirely new in one case a uh, a fantasy se- a medieval setting populated by apes and another, an entirely new breed of of action filmmaking that is set in this weird post-apocalypse populated by crazy people and their even mm. crazier cars. So I think that there is a lot to be mined structurally from those. Not And also, I think that actually strengthens the idea of the, the Mad Max series as an anthology because each episode of Mad Max, each installment of Mad Max has its own distinct world and tone that it's trying to hit, including Furiosa, which is a separate thing from Fury Road. God, that that is also another thing I've been thinking about of just how different they feel. Even though they are you know, really hitting a lot of the same bots there together, it feels like even the few years removed it's like the few years removed between Mad Max 1 and Mad Max 2 a little bit where you're like well we know there's an evolution to an extreme degree that we just kind of don't see it's off screen there's the evolution of the person and the the evolution of the place very more specifically I don't think we can dance around it any longer let's call an official spoiler warning for Furiosa a Mad Max saga and in turn all the other Mad Max films let's this was uh, we're talking about violence and brutality this was one of the most truly the most disturbing violent mad max things ever watching how furiosa's arm is shredded on a monster truck tire then she is dangled from it by a chain and just the amount of time and gravity that is happening in that scene she just is it is ripped from her shoulder it is so like it's not her shoulder it's ripped from her elbow region it's too much of an arm to be just like fleshy shreds that are just like strewn about absolutely disgusting well i that is something that really stuck with me is how they do not shy away from how it's not just like an arm hanging there like a halloween decoration i mean it is really like tendons hanging out of this handcuff like worse worse than if she had literally chewed herself out of it like a trapped animal you know it is so visceral and then smash cut to the maggot farm (laughs) where her stump (laughs) is just infected and full of maggots just a real one-two punch for the folks at home don't you think it's It's real horrible you thought deformed uh stillborn baby who is two babies that share a head was bad you thought that was bad no that's that was like that was the warm-up set for (laughs) god yeah truly just the waking up in a rotting pile of bodies real fun real fun stuff my god i mean not to mention even something as visceral as being drawn and quartered with chains and motorcycles even even as covered in dust as it was in the desert, it was disgusting to see and think about. You, just like, mm-hmm. you get, like, the one guy, you catch a glimpse of, like, a leg up to the hip being dragged off. Mm-hmm. And, and you know that he had one around his head, too. It's just so rough. But it's at least... They're merciful with us in that they cut away and they leave a lot of it to be imagined. Mm. In Furiosa's suffering, there is a a fixation. Um, and I don't think it's in a perverse or misogynistic way, the way I may talk about other filmmakers who focus on female violence like that. It is all to show you the hell 
that Furiosa has gone through, and one of the problems with prequels is that they are, in some capacity, tensionless. Because, not that the only tension that can be derived from a situation is a character's life or death, but, especially in a series like Mad Max, mm. that's what so much of what the tension of the action is. And, sure, while we don't know outcomes of most of Furiosa's companions along the way while we're watching the film, Furiosa, we know, is going to make it to Fury Road, Free the Wives, Meet Max, you know, do all of the things that she does throughout Fury Road and make it to the end okay, but they have a strength in Furiosa's character is that they can do a lot to her before... Oh, yeah. You know, we could relax because the movie weaponizes that. It, it it reminds you, I think, kind of constantly about how far Furiosa is going to fall before the end of the film that you're watching. Even something as simple as her tattooing a map home that we know she'll never get to use because that arm's going to get severed by the time she makes it home again is a really nice touch of Miller to not beat it over the head, reminding you that she's going to lose that arm, but to subtly, you know, be like, hey, she didn't have that in the last one, did she? I wonder why. Yeah, I wonder yeah. why she didn't. Oh, God. It's it's almost like Furiosa got her Road Warrior first, and then now we're getting her Mad Max, you know? it's Max Rakitansky was already a, kind of a a cold-blooded man by the time we're getting to him in, in the apocalyptic setting. But, you know, same with Furiosa in Fury Road. She is, like, cold-hearted, cold as steel, ready to kill, do whatever. It's in, it's such a great way that we're getting this backstory. We're seeing her turn into punished Furiosa with her with her shaved head and her mechanical arm in, like you're saying, a way that doesn't take away from her already being like arguably as badass or more badass than max himself when they meet up on the rig together another very interesting thing that i've been reading in blood sweat and chrome is charlie Theron talking about how difficult it was to find the character of furiosa and what is i mean this sounds so trite but what's her motivation and that charlie Theron started that production as Furiosa is motivated by revenge that look at all these men who uh, who have kept her captive abused her mistreated her etc and not only is she going to get away from them and get back to the home that she wants to to find again but she's gonna stick it to them by bringing their their prized wives along the way and then that slowly and especially spurred by the fact that she became a mother during the production of Fury Road, she found a deeper underlying compassion in Furiosa, which is part of what makes her, I think, such an interesting character, is that it's really easy to just write a woman who's a badass, um, and that's kind of the problem with a lot of, quote, strong female characters, is that they tend to lose a lot of their humanity in an effort to make them so so cool and so tough and furiosa's superpower is that part of the reason she's doing all of this is to save these women like she could just take the rig alone and go back to the green place but she is motivated to help these innocent girls find a life beyond what has been allotted for them and seeing that character have these interactions throughout furiosa where she is shown kindness and compassion, and it's instilled in her, even though her environment forces her to become crueler and, and more brutal and more calloused, really does a great way of organically showing how both sides of that character can ring true. Yeah, definitely. The, all the stuff with the uh, peach pit that she is carrying with her, throughout all of this her reminder of home her her rock that is like a huge part of her individual motivation in you know just furiosa obviously but the way that that wraps up and connects 
perfectly to the start of her events in Fury Road in a way that's not just like, well, she did everything, you know, she got back and she planted her her uh, peach tree pit in a perfect location and everything was fine. It's still in this idea of not necessarily being able to get back exactly what she was what was taken from her but in her own symbolic way using that the the punishment of dementis the aid technically i suppose that planting that tree in the citadel gives to immortan joe and the others that are exploitative and violent and don't understand her for who she is and what she wants i i think that was a really interesting way to show that and now i'm Thinking more, I'm sorry, about Chris Hemsworth, Chris Hemsworth, <laughs> Chris Hemsworth's emaciated tree body that he is being kept alive with. And that is maybe one of the more disturbing parts that I didn't bring up before in terms of like body yeah. horror ideas. It's gnarly. It's very, very. And one of the images that I think is straight out of something like 3000 Years of Longing, a much more, you know elevated fantasy world than Mad Max is traditionally allowed to be. But as we alluded to in non-spoilers, this film explicitly sets up the fact that this is not only being told by one of the story men, which of course is kind of how the others are told, like like um, mostly Road Warrior. I was going to say, yeah, at the very least specifically Road Warrior. But not only having it be told through this kind of third-party narrator, but having there be multiple versions of a myth that is explicitly stated to be told by multiple people, multiple ways, that ultimately get to a similar thematic conclusion, but much like ancient mythology has a certain degree of wiggle room in the exact events of the story. I also want to bring up, while we're somehow talking about the end of the film at the beginning... (laughs) As we usually do. That is true. I think a, a slight shortcoming of this film, and I don't think it's dissatisfying, because I think it does a really good job of making this conflict between Furiosa and Dementis engaging... Uh, And that's how the movie resolves, is with the resolution of that conflict. It is really, I don't know, it's both smart and a little bit dissatisfying that what is essentially the third act of this movie is the entire movie, Mad Max Fury Road. Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, that is an interesting... You're talking about, like, the the end-to-end here? Or are you talking about, like... I mean, like, the third... Structurally... What what is the third act of Furiosa's story of growing up, becoming brutalized, turning around, making herself stronger, uh, so that she can survive in the wasteland, and then the third act of that coming back and and sticking it to the people who made her this way, and also learning to save others. The a good chunk of that third thing is just the movie Mad Max right. Fury Road. Yeah, that is that is an interesting, and they really remind you of that too over the credits with basically a full recap trailer for Fury Road. It's like listen, which I was very into, and again made me wish that they would just start playing Fury Road immediately <laughs> yeah, after yeah. the movie ended. Bridget like that to to truly Rogue One it is what how I was saying it in the theater. <laughs> That's what you said. And in the theater the second the movie ended, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, it's really... Uh, which I don't I don't disagree. Um, she, handed and I the, don't... The, she handed the wives a peach slice, and, and they said, what is this? And she said, hope. And then they rolled credits. You know, they, And then really you going. were like, man, Zoe Kravitz looks really plastic <laughs> in this movie. Um, oh, weird, weird, weird. I think, I actually, I think that's a pretty apt comparison. And not that I think Rogue One is anywhere near as good as this movie is, but does do a lot of the same things well that this movie does in terms of understanding how to set up a a prequel story that is inherently satisfying. Rogue One does that by distancing itself more until its end from the original that you know so well. But I I like it's a valid comparison and I don't think it's just like a shit posty one like we were talking about with with you know Dante or whatever. Right, right. Well, cuz I mean again, we're 
the craft in which they're making these connections. It feels more about, like, the immediate relationships of Furiosa than, like, they're, you know, we get one glimpse of Max himself in the distance, completely removed as just, like, a little nudge reminder. And we're not, like, getting to the Citadel and suddenly we're doing every single thing we know from Fury Road. There are it's small mm-hmm. it's small things. The the organic mechanic fellow and the the wives themselves great the, implementation of the yeah, organic right? mechanic. Very much appreciated that. But as opposed to Rogue One, which is very much like, all right, we, we are checking every Doctor Ezevon, <laughs> what are you doing here on Scarif? Wait, are, isn't this place gonna get death started in like twenty minutes? You better get on your shuttle to Moss Eisley. <laughs> exactly, you know, but that, but here we have just enough. Just enough to know that it's the story, it's the it's the world of and mm-hmm. we're not going to we're not going to force that on anybody. Well, I also think that there is a glee in some of the characters look at like Rictus Erectus looks exactly the same. Sure, and yeah. Some of them, you could tell that their change in circumstances has taken a physical toll. Um, I mean, Charlie's, Theron's, the Furiosa obviously bears a very distinct difference from the Furiosa that begins this movie. Of course. But somebody like the organic mechanic who like looks a lot worse when we see him in Fury Road, and I think that's intentional, that the implication that Morton Joe is not keeping as good of care of his guys as Dementis does, which I think is is text. That's true. I think, you know, you can see that that's one of the more interesting and compelling things about Dementis is he, even though he's horrible and sadistic and he has his, I know that you are itching to talk about the nipple rings. Um, Always. (laughs) (laughs) Um, he does have a code, like, dude's gotta have a code, and he's got a code, which is, but my people are my people, and I take care of them. And that is something that makes him almost look sane compared to a Morton Joe, but then you flip it around and you see how he ends up running gas town into the ground, and you're like, well, a Morton Joe, actually pretty, you know, he's he's, he's getting done what needs to get done, and then you're like, no, this is this is how they win, is by pitting, <laughs> exactly. by pitting yeah. the two forms of insanity against each other. <laughs> you're, there you're... are no real-world uh, current events that are relevant to no, this. No, no, you shut your mouth. There, there's nothing. War boys! War boys! <laughs> I'm, I'm making the V8s above my head. <laughs> good, good, good. I uh hate to say that you know maybe Dementis uh he, could, he he was trying to he's conquering for his people you're right he has this own internal need to be like he's the red Dementis at a certain point he needs the theatrics to to keep the confidence of his people he's trying to track down Furiosa's home to share that abundance with his starving people but you're right it is pitting the torture murderer marauder king versus like the cult rapists torture marauder king of the citadel and in in the perspective of furiosa you know you pick option c probably as as she yeah. does in fury road i think it's a it's a really interesting way to set that up of oh man dementis is like kind of treating her well and you know, you can tell it's a facade from the start when they get to his camp at the beginning and he's like, well, keep her safe, keep her fed, I'm going to take care of you. Obviously, that's got some sinister overtones, but then... Yeah, for sure. There is a certain point when he's like making the deal with a Morton Joe where he's like, this is my daughter and I don't maybe want to trade her to you as a wife that you kind of feel like he maybe does actually care a little bit about what happens to her. Yeah, there's there is a real humanity to him that again, I think Hemsworth it's so good to see him out of the box and oh, being so able nice. to really dig into a performance. But the idea that he does think that he's preparing Furiosa appropriately or as he calls her little Dementis, um little D for the wasteland and not to say that I don't think that he's definitively the villain of this movie. There's an argument to be made that he's right. Like, an undercurrent of all of the Mad Max films is brutality is necessary for survival in this world. And how you go about choosing when to be brutal is what makes you different. And what makes a mm-hmm. good person versus a bad person. And so... While, De- like, Dementis is teaching Furiosa exactly what 
is true, which is like, you mean she gets direct advice that's like, Dementis will like you if you prove that you're indispensable. And she does exactly that with Morton Joe in the latter half of the film. But also, you know, we see that Dementis is, does not have any mercy, really. He doesn't have the ability to turn off his sadism even as, you know, he's slowly torturing Furiosa's mother to death. And then, mm. very, you know, that was another thing that I was surprised that we were mercifully kind of taken away from in the midst of it, because that, it was getting to be rough, and I was like, okay, oh, good, yeah. they're gonna take take us out of, out of here, and just, we know that Furiosa watched her brutally get burned, slash whatever else was happening behind that torture guy's head, to death, and we don't need to see the whole thing unfold. Again, I don't think, I do not think Miller takes glee in torturing his heroes. I, I think he takes glee in, in violence, oh, but sure. not to the same problematic degree that a lot of contemporary filmmakers are not able to see the differentiation between. Yeah, there is, there is, it's very, it's tastefully done as much as a torture scene can be, I suppose. There's, it is enough to make us feel uncomfortable and enough to really understand the the punishment that Furious goes through at such a young age. And I mean, right after that is, you know, her living in a cage, you know, being carted around, seeing other executions. But again, at the same time, he's like keeping her safe in that cage. He's technically giving her access to an education through the history man that shares the space with her. He's... You know, I don't know. It, it's weird for me to be listing the things that uh, a guy named Dementis is doing right in raising the girl mm. that he kidnapped, but turning it around of, like, their final moments together. You know, do you have it in you to make it epic? He wants her to rise above him almost, you know? He wants to have this girl that, for whatever reason, f he feels a level of responsibility for how she turned out, even though he doesn't see her for however many years. It seems like a level of nurturing that he would give anybody in the wasteland almost to, to to rise above to survive, like you're saying. And then take their take their definitely not you know five dollar uh, five below Mad Max and drag him behind motorcycles oh. while his dogs slowly yeah. rip him apart. That is I, it, 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 the emphasis on everyone Furiosa has ever loved has died horribly in front of her. Yeah. Is something that I'm really, again, impressed by this movie's commitment to. Because that is not a pleasant thing to put in, in your, hey, big action blockbuster, most anticipated action movie of the year, Furiosa. What if we watched Andy Taylor Joy's boyfriend get ripped apart? Wouldn't that be fun? God, I was really, I really liked him too. As much as it was a weird, like, Max stand in, Jack. That that sucked to watch, truly. And I mean, it's such a shocking series of events. Obviously, you have the big, uh, the big bullet farm showdown. That was the bullet farm, right? Yes, yes. Because Gastown, different story, and then the Citadel. Obviously. Yeah, because they're gonna take because they took the bullet farm, and then there was yeah, a whole yeah. Thing. So yeah, that pretty shocking altogether. Just the 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 slow fade to the like hours later. Dementis has been just like I guess enjoying the sound of a man's body being dragged in the in the desert yeah. it's it, it it i almost forgot about it when it's the smash cut to furiosa's dangling arm and somehow she escaped the circle of motorcycles hid in the cloud of dust i'm sure but but yeah i enjoyed jack uh whatever his actual thing was. praetorian he, jack praetorian jack he he Which makes, is such uh, a familiar name, such a great Mad Max name, that I was convinced that he was a guy that I was forgetting. Oh, interesting. Like a guy, like Two Scrotus minutes on screen, from the game. I was, yeah, like, I was like, Praetorian Jack is so familiar, but I think it, what it actually was is it just fits so well into the established naming conventions of the series. Well, I, well if, we're, if we're going to Pre Praetorian Jack here, and his... his <laughs> You, you want to talk about the bombing knocker boy? Is that what you want to talk about? Well, I was going to get into the implications of Road Warrior as an occupation slash hobby. <laughs> oh, sure. Well, okay. No. 
I, you and I disagreed with this the night we saw it, and I'm going to push back on you again, which is Road... The War Rig. There is... In the world of Mad Max, there is Road War, just like we have Air War and Sea War, right? Oh, of course, like, of course. But the fact that he comes matched with the uh, MPF, like leather shoulder strap thing and he even like makes reference to his parents maybe being part of the MPF I uh yeah and he get and he gives Furiosa a two barrel shotgun yeah yeah like it's like it's a specific like it's a very specific gesture he gets her like a nice double barrel shotgun you know it's not just mm-hmm. like a junker or whatever that they usually work with and she gets a road warrior shoulder pad jacket too maybe oh that's and true she, she kind of yeah. starts to adopt that level of wastelander that that he mm-hmm. is clearly capable of being i do think that he is the least elegant hey here's why furiosa might do this in fury road moment of like hey she knew a guy that was a lot like max once so maybe that's why she would trust him and i do i do think it's a little bit like he could have been a little bit less max and I have read that originally Yaya Abdul Mateen the second was cast and had to drop out, which I think might have like at least visually differentiated him from Max enough. Um, who, who is that again? Do I know that? Yaya Abdul Mateen. He I think I'd was remember on by his name. The Watchmen show that you didn't watch. He is. Uh, he's in the the Candyman remake that I don't think you saw. He oh he's. Freaking, um, he's Black Manta from Aquaman. Oh, yeah. Oh, that would have been really interesting, actually. Yeah. Yeah, and I I mean, I think this guy, whose name I don't know, did did a good job. I enjoyed him. I don't think it's his fault that his character is the way that it is. And I do think that he and Ani Taylor-Joy have good chemistry. Oh, definitely. But, but I do think they could have distanced him from Max a little bit more. Yeah, I, I was hoping he was going to be nicer, maybe? Like, I I, I wanted him to be different. In He's a, nicer in, than Max. Well, sure, but I, I wanted him to be less Max gruff, maybe. I don't know. There's an interesting relationship that they have where it's not even, like, super explicit how romantic it is, but clearly is some kind of romantic. It's more than just, like, a regular mentor, mentee, friendship, whatever, co-worker. It's weird to call them co-workers, but I guess they technically are. <laughs> you know, they drive a truck together. They drive a rig together. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. They have to they have to register their relationship with E. Morton Joe, HR, in the Citadel. It'll be, you know. I just, well, that's the thing. It's It feels more like Roman normally allowed to happen in the Wasteland, is probably how I would characterize it. Because none of the Mad Max films, aside from the first, which is decidedly before the fall of whatever happened, happened yes. to Australia. Yes. That's the only one that really has any romance in it. I would say the second most prevalent romantic thread outside of Furiosa would probably be Nux and yeah, oh yeah, whichever sure. wife that he I can't because they're splendid, that's not her. Toast the knowing, that's not her. I know some of their she's, other names that are not coming in, to me right now. Riley Keoff, whichever yeah, one I, she did. Exactly, yes. That is probably and then third is probably the uh the twink guy on the back of the motorcycle and Road Warrior. I mean, yeah, that off. actually is probably <laughs> true. Uh, that yeah. I <laughs> Dude, that that Marauder guy is so upset when Feral Kid kills him. He is in love with that blonde guy yeah. you know I, yeah, I mean yeah it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty obvious what's going on there uh, because even like the one time that they really kind of try to give Max a love interest outside of the first one is he has sexual t- tension with one of the warrior women in Road Warrior that's killed in the third act and then yeah. that's just kind of the end of it <laughs> yeah Oh, gosh. And I, you know, I was really satisfied with Fury Road that they didn't try to shoehorn any weird stuff between the two, the man and the female lead. That is one of the great attributes of Fury Road. (laughs) Exactly. And truly. In that, I feel more compelled by her romance with Jack in a way that, like, she's had her her road warrior that she's lost. She, She has no more room in her heart for Max Rakitansky. She cares about the wives and the rig and getting away from things. And there's not even a question with her and him, really. And I mean, that's as much him as it is her, I suppose. But it feels a lot more earned when we know that she, again, has lost 
every single person she's ever loved in the worst way she could never imagine. And also, you know, Valkyrie, who seems to be her little best friend at the beginning of this movie, dies in Fury Road. She does? Oh, God, I should rewatch Fury Road and be sad. I thought that was her sister. Does she have a sister? I don't know. I think I'm pretty well, sure that Valkyrie... Assumed... Because, okay, let's let's chat for a second. Let's. Let's watch At the beginning of this movie, when, Val- when Furiosa is taken by the bikers, Valkyrie is up on this, like, this outcropping of rock where she and Furiosa were harvesting peaches. And there is a shot overlooking the desert of this convoy pulling away, and in the left lower third, Valkyrie is, like, standing and kind of looking after them in a very specific gestural position that is then mirrored in Fury Road, where on the right side of the the screen, the right lower third, so a mirror image coming and going, she watches the war rig pull up when she's up in the tower Mm. uh trying to you know that's bait that whole bit so i think that that's a really interesting one way to visually connect that that's the same character but two mirror furiosa's departure from the green place and then the the refinding of her Mm -hmm. people in fury road you can really tell how much these stories were written for each other kind of you know i I know there's so much i'm sure you're getting insane insight when you're reading your your chrome book over there what is that called yeah that's not the right way to say blood sweat sweat and and chrome Chrome. thank you very much i'm sure you're getting so much more insight onto how crazy deep that goes but watching these movies nine years apart you wouldn't you wouldn't even feel like there's been a decade of development between the two. It truly feels like such a perfect companion. Also, I looked this up because we were discussing this. Elsa Pataki, who I've learned the name of for this show, is both Don Toretto's baby mama in the Fast and the (laughs) Furious movies and Chris Hemsworth's real-life wife, which I think I did know but did not collect oh. that data in my brain because i think i knew that because she's this is such a weird little aside at the end of thor 2 the second thor <laughs> there's a moment where he kisses natalie portman and it's not natalie portman it's his wife in a brown wig because they couldn't get natalie portman back for the reshoot that's incredible does it and look so good I knew, i mean it's a it's a wide i haven't okay, seen that movie right. in 15 years i don't know i've um, seen it recently and i don't know so <laughs> But she is not only one of the Vuvellini, sni- the sniper at the beginning, who's with Furiosa's mom, um, who, by the way, uh, the lady who plays Furiosa's mom, outstanding, a really an amazing performance. Oh, um, absolutely. Charlie Fraser. Holy smoly. Really impressed with her. Also, I just saw her in Glenn Powell. Come on, Garrett. Anyone but you. <laughs> Uh, which is not a very good movie, but she I, I enjoyed her in that, and then immediately after I saw that, I saw her in this, and I was impressed with that. Anyway, Elsa Pataki, the sniper at the beginning of this, who is presumably one of the old ladies that we later see mm. in Fury Road, presumably one of the old ladies with the sniper rifle, also plays the weird, the biker gang lady who has the, the really up messed face. up... Yeah, nice. I was I was hoping we'd get more out of her, if I'm being honest. I loved her nasty, mangled, biker gang lady face. I, I thought it was phenomenal. We see her, she gets a decent death in the third act. I, Furiosa runs her over or something. I, I was going to say, exact... did she get, like, run through, like, the rig tires? Like, did she get shredded, maybe? Oh, I think maybe, she, yes, she does. I think she does, and it's there's some good. kind of weird... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a good action sequence, that last action sequence. Um, Absolutely. Oh man. Which I admire that the end of this movie is not trying to be the ultimate spectacle. Like the last action sequence is not the biggest action sequence. It's just the most satisfying because it's the one where she's getting revenge on all the people who have wronged her throughout the movie. Because the movie also knows the biggest action sequence, the one that is the grand finale of the film, is, once again, the (laughs) (laughs) two-hour-long action sequence that is Mad Max Fury Road. I cannot permit us to move on without discussing the Bobby Knocker boy. I, if you didn't, I was just about to. So good. We are, we are truly in sync. 
Talk, talk to me, Seamus. Talk to me about your experience with this <laughs> action sequence and with the bombing like, <laughs> like it's its own separate thing. I mean, honestly, yeah. cracking me up. The bombing knocker guy, <laughs> the master to an absent blaster. Well, the bobby knocker <laughs> seems to be the blaster, perhaps. He's just like I a weird, that as well. <laughs> weird little guy in the vegetable carriage of the war rig, spraying his spray paint on his hands because he's just a curious little guy. I <laughs> loved him. Loved him and actually devastated that he just gets his head blown off and he doesn't even get to activate the bobby knocker. I'm so sad. He was so excited. No, because he, he's a coward. Because oh. he, he, he should have died with glory on the road to Valhalla, shiny and chrome. <laughs> Morton Joe was so disappointed in our boy when he got picked out of the carrots. Mediocre, that's what he said. So sad. But the fact that Furiosa is sad about the Bobby Knocker boy, I think also, at that point in the story, she has been dehumanized so much. But it shows that she still has that that compassion. And again, it makes me think about the other war boy hiding on the back of the war rig after after failing to, mm. to find Valhalla. That is, that's, a, I think, a much more elegant thread then this guy looks like max doesn't he doesn't he doesn't he, doesn't he remind you of max <laughs> yeah much more elegant yeah i i honestly wish we got more war boy stuff not to say that i wanted like dh I nicholas I... holt in there nicholas holt was actually the guy that the dude pointed to first so then it was the guy next to him or whatever they could slip in yeah there. that's yeah that i mean in in the, you would have seen young slip and young nux go you won't do it. You wouldn't. If you got picked, you wouldn't jump off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god. Speaking of war boys, I cannot, I cannot stress enough that all of the lack of war boy we got is made up for by piss boy. So piss between Bobby Knocker boy and piss boy, wow. That truly, they should have been the star. That's that's Furiosa two and a half, where it's just those two guys like getting ready for the raid and I waiting for and piss Furiosa, boy. Maybe. Piss boy. <laughs> Waiting for Furiosa, that's pretty good. <laughs> Where they're just standing by the war rig but both overnight. Just peeing into jars. The the little guy's just like, I I've I've got no more. He's like, drink some piss, you'll get more. Drink some piss. They're definitely pee. drinking piss to make more of that piss, right? They're just they don't well, care. I love that he when he crawls up on the front is is squirting it in and is going, Drink my dear, drink this lovely piss. <laughs> It's such an important job. He has he's got like the highest rank out of anybody on that rig if you ask me. He's such an important mechanic. And then he like does a backflip into the car in front of them with a bomb yes! and says oh! witness me. He like does a jackknife backwards holding two <laughs> bomb spears. It is crazy. That must have smelled horrible when he landed in that car. <laughs> Jeez Louise. <laughs> Uh, so I think that something that this movie does well is it does not shy away from the horrors of the entire Immortan Joe kingdom, but it also lets the characters be her explicit allies, which I think is a very fun, like, the war boys get to be a little bit more badass in this because they're implicitly on Furiosa's side. Exactly, yeah. Those, and those combat missions on the rig we get a little bit more back and forth because we know really the only person that needs to end up on the other side is Furiosa. Exactly. And we get a little bit of that in Fury Road which I think will hit different now at the very beginning when the buzzards come and try to get them and her little crew of war boys takes care of them. Oh man, the little... Oh, that's so good. I think we've done a pretty good job talking through this. We've certainly been talking long enough about this movie i'm sure we will have much more to to mine out i like i said i want to see it again i'll probably throw it on when it hits streaming if i if i don't get the pleasure to go see it in imax again but i i would recommend this to anybody that enjoyed fury road just be be prepared for some gnarly stuff i yeah i don't i don't think it's the masterpiece that fury road is i still think it's um probably the best action movie of the decade oh, so man. far it's <laughs> of the last uh nine and a half years so to say something something around well there. i i meant i meant more the 2020s but oh, i mean sure, if sure. i'm being honest yeah kind of the only the only uh, the only two action movies that i can think of for me that come anywhere near this caliber since Fury Road have been, and you're going to say them before I do, Top Gun Maverick and Mission Impossible Fallout. Well, you were faster than me, but I sure thought them at the same time as you. (laughs) 
it's like, huh, it couldn't be the two actual best action movies. Oh, well, I guess they are, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the truth of it. And we are living, I don't have time to get into this thesis because we wasted all our time talking about the actual movie. <laughs> but I know what um, you're going to say right now. That we're living in the heyday of the spectacle action film, and I feel very glad to be living through it with AMC A-List where I can go see movies in Ooh. premium formats as many times as I so please. Absolutely. You know we'll be there for the, the, the Fury Road re-release, fingers crossed, someday. Oh, I, I, it, other than the fact that they probably just didn't have enough theaters because so many movies are coming out in rapid succession this summer, I don't understand why I cannot find a place that's doing it. I, it I would like, I, no I've sense. seen that movie no in sense. the theaters three times. I would like to see it again. Me too, me too. But until then, I think that wraps us up for the main segment. What do you say we kick it on over to our reference this week? Let's do it. For today's pop culture reference, we're going to be discussing Furiosa's insane production history. During the 15-year-long period of pre-production for the Mad Max Legacy reboot, George Miller and co-writer Nico Lothorius developed detailed backstories for every secondary character that was new to the franchise, paying special attention to the new protagonist, Imperator Furiosa. Miller claims that Furiosa was fully scripted, almost entirely storyboarded, and even distributed to key cast and crew members before the filming of Fury Road even began. The early screenplay for the standalone Furiosa film was initially supposed to be shot back-to-back with Fury Road, but a wave of shooting location changes, rewrites, and compensation disputes with Warner Brothers led Miller to focus on Fury Road alone, with a Charlie's Theron-led Furiosa film still being developed for a future date. An anime-style prequel series following Furiosa was also in its early stages with legendary storyboard artist and animation designer Mihiro Maeda at the helm, but was also cancelled and co-opted into the design of what the live-action Furiosa is now. During the development of the Mad Max video game from Avalanche Studios, details of Miller's unreleased installments in the franchise were used to link the game into the famously and purposefully muddy canon but would ultimately receive middling acclaim from both fans and Miller himself upon its release due to major gameplay restructuring after a full year of development. Production took so long to resume on Furiosa that Miller originally considered using de-aging technology on Charlize Theron to have her reprise her role, but cast Anya Taylor-Joy in 2020 to utilize different AI face-mapping technology in scenes involving the character as a young child. According to Miller... Another film that has been continually worked on since before Fury Road, simply named The Wasteland, is supposedly in pre-production that utilizes even more of the preparation and writing that went into producing Fury Road and Furiosa, and shrinks the gap between the two established films even further. Something that I do think is interesting, um, a lot of this is stuff that I have gleaned from reading Blood, Sweat, and Chrome, the Mm book about the production of Mad Max Fury Road, for those of you who did not listen to the main segment. But I do think there is some, and I won't get into specifics here because we're not in spoilers for Fury, but I would like to read this older version of the script. There are some things that Charlize Theron refers to as being part of the character's backstory that are not exactly reflected in the final Furiosa film. So I would love to know... When that change happened, how loose the scripting was, because the way that the narrative is being told now, and not that I don't think it's an accurate one, is that this is fairly faithfully the Furiosa film that they have wanted to make for the last 15 years. I don't know if I could fit any more words that start with f into that <laughs> sentence but i'll certainly try i mean but yeah we've been uh even by the end of the main segment we're starting to fumble over furiosa fury road all the all that kind of stuff but yeah it feels it feels i would love to read that book once you're finished up with it and i'm finished with all the other books that you've given me to read that i never finished uh i would love to get a little more insight on that as well because the the saga of this production just seems as mythological at this point as as mad max itself there's so much weird specifics to to what george miller had in store and has been building on for decades now i'm you know very very curious to see what they have in there what do you say we kick it on over to save the rec center this week save the rec center Now it's time to save the rec center, where we give you our weekly recommendations. 
What do you got for me this week? A movie, Seamus, that I didn't know anything about before I watched it. Which is, as you know, a rare and scrumptious treat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> don't <laughs> giggle at me, oh, sir. I was going to say, is this the secret Wonka that I don't know about? <laughs> scrumptious <laughs> treat. An, an incredible edible. <laughs> um, Scratch that. Reverse it. I recently checked out on the Criterion Channel's Shirley MacLaine collection that they have put out the 1964 bizarre kind of a musical technicolor romp what a way to go which follows shirley MacLaine as a young woman who has a series of wealthy husbands which befall unfortunate fates huh. despite all she wants to do it's like a series of unfortunate events, except Shirley MacLaine ke- keeps getting married to mid-century Hollywood royalty, like <laughs> Dick Van Dyke, Gene Kelly, Dean Martin, Whoa. Robert Mitchum, and Paul Newman. Whoa, wait, what? Really? Wait, like, are you, are these examples, or are these in the movie? No, these are all five of those wow. guys are in the movie. Wild, holy moly. So, it is incredibly campy. It's a ton of fun. There are a couple of scenes that clearly the Barbie production designers were just like, we're just going to do this. (laughs) If we could just do this, let's do that. Incredible. Incredible. I was very impressed with it. It's a absolutely bizarre film. I don't know if it would be for everybody, but it is enough of a spectacle that it is worth trying out, certainly. Well, that sounds absolutely lovely. I think just the cast list alone is going to get me to sit down and watch this one. As the tagline said, Seamus, what a cast, what a past, what a show. Oh, magic. That's magic, as as That's our magic. friend Nicole Kidman would say. As our personal friend of the podcast, Nicole we see her at least once a week. Yes, um, she looks right at me. <laughs> it's true. It's like when you're sitting in a 3D movie and, and when they point out at this camera, they're pointing at every single individual member of the audience. I just bumped my mic. You're uh, excited. You're thinking about Nicole. I am thinking about Nicole. But Seamus, what do you have to save the rec center this week? I had the pleasure of being shown by one Dr. Movies Garrett Strother bad times at the El Royale this weekend. And I truly have not stopped thinking about it since. It is everything I've ever wanted in a movie, maybe? A, A stellar cast incredible aesthetic of the late 60s early 70s in nevada slash california thank you very much rooms in california cost a dollar more without giving too much away it is truly like the best things of the hateful eight meet the best things about once upon a time in hollywood and bob from top gun maverick is there so you really get a cherry (laughs) on top you know i'll learn his name someday which i know you know I do know it. It's Lewis Pullman. He's Bill Pullman's son. And once yes. you learn that, there's no going back. You'd think. You'd think that, Garrett, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'm just, I would still call him Bob. You, you would think that there are three <laughs> Top Gun Maverick uh, cast members in this movie. John Hamm, <laughs> oh, Manny yeah. Jacinto from The Good Place, whose name I don't know how to pronounce, but will say confidently. Sure. And, of course, Lewis Pullman. I... Uh loved this movie i had no idea what it was going in i had completely missed it when it had come out as did apparently everyone in the world because i've been trying to convince everybody that i know to give it a shot and they barely know what it is just like i did but dare i say the best way to maybe go into that movie five years late is to know nothing about it because my mind was actually blown yeah i thought it was phenomenal i am so glad that you enjoyed it, Seamus. This is one that I have been waiting to show you literally for years, um, and the time has just never been right, and the the convergence of certain actors from certain recent projects that uh. we were excited about <laughs> being in Bad Times at El Royale, uh, therefore turning me into finally purchasing a physical copy of mm. Bad Times at the El Royale led to you finally getting to be exposed to one of my favorite B-movie romps of the last several years, and I'm just, I'm relieved at how much you enjoyed it. Truly. Thank you for fi- for sitting me down. I There's been like 160-something episodes of this podcast. I guarantee at least 100 times I've said, oh, that's some bad times at the El Royale, and then immediately follow that with, I should probably watch that sometime. 
Because it's a great title. Like people, <laughs> it's, it's title. part of the reason it didn't make money is because it's a not very marketable title. However, it's an excellent description of what that movie is, oh, and yes. I think it's a very catchy title. I th- it's one that I, I enjoy it. saying. Yeah, and it's will, easy to, <laughs> like you said, it's easy to work in the conversation. Exactly. I will continue to say it now with context. I won't have the second half of that anymore. But that wraps us up for this week's episode of Pop Culture Reference. If you want to reach the show on social media, you can find us at PCR Podcast on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. You can email us at popculturereferencepod at gmail.com. You can like us on Facebook, YouTube, wherever you're listening to this podcast. Any amount of engagement does a tremendous amount to help out the show. So please go ahead and do that. Next week, we will be covering... Wait a second. I forgot. It's Glenn Powell Summer. We'll be covering <laughs> Hitman. <laughs> Thank you. For God. the show. Uh, straight out uh, of Ape Spring into Glenn Powell Summer. I couldn't straight I out, have as, it any other as way. As stated last week on this show, <laughs> yeah. Glenn Powell Summer is upon us. Very excited about, about Hitman. I like Glenn Powell a lot. I like Richard Linklater a lot. I think the actor who plays Bix on Andor, whose name I don't know, who was also on the first season of Good Omens, is good, and I enjoy seeing her in things, mm. and I hope that she's also continuing to be good in this. Uh, based too. on reviews, I would say that that's probably true. I've been, uh, I've been very so, tickled by all these little ads of his different outfits that I keep getting, so I'm somehow the marketing is really getting to me in a positive way. I'm excited. Uh, too bad that we have to watch it on Netflix, everybody. Ah, uh, Netflix nuisance all right at the end. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> That's not even what a Netflix nuisance sounds like, but I'm continuing the bit from the top of the show. Good that man. You did. Good man. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week. Adios, war boys.